don't worry too much if you feel like this excludes you it absolutely does not and you could follow follow along here doing offline rendering using turtle if you want and you're laughing because you know you know what turtles like um. so you think you're top stuff well i have a mission for you let's see how you do without your precious open gl raycaster for scene using turtle for now I just want you to draw some boxes, later on you'll fill them with views of the scene. Shake off the rust and get coding. Oh my goodness, I've been given the draw the turtle graphics challenge. Okay, so, let me just open up, I've got my Python folder here, I'll make a new one, I'll call it turtle challenge, doesn't really matter. Now I'll just go ahead and open that up in VS Code, and we'll make something. Okay, so of course, to start with, we'll need to import turtle. And I wonder if this works. Let's go turtle set up. Looks like it has some sort of default values, I think. So let's see how that goes. Um, turtle done. Okay, if I run this, fingers crossed. There we go. We get some sort of window. Now, I want to set the size of this window. Specifically, I'm going to set it to 800 by 400. I just came up with those numbers. So what I'll do is I'll say, define a constant width and height. Now I could put that in like screen size zero, screen size one to get the individual components, or there's this option as well. What this does is it unpacks the tuple directly in place. So if we run this, We've now got a width and height set appropriately. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to draw some rectangles. I want to have a rectangle up the top for any title or heading that I want. And then I want a top-down world view and a perspective view. Okay. So the way Turtle's coordinate system works is that negative x is to the left, of course, positive x to the right, and then negative y is down at the bottom of the screen and positive y is at the top of the screen. We have a center of zero, zero. So that's why we have these values here. So I'm gonna start making a few constants. So to sort of bundle that together, I'm gonna make what's called a region if I declare region and end region, then I should be able to now compress this. Cool. Now I'm going to make another section because I want to make a, a function basically that will draw a rectangle. So this will be my functions section. That will take a bounding box, which will be a tuple consisting of tuples of integers, and it will return nothing. Okay, so the thing with Turtle is Turtle is like a state machine. It's a single robot, sort of. So we need to think of think very explicitly. So the first thing I want to do is I want to send my Turtle to the top left corner of the rectangle that I'm going to draw, and then drop it down ready to draw. So what I'll do is I will call pen up so the turtle raises its pen from whatever position it's at, and that means when I go to this specific position, in this case, the top left corner, element zero of the bounding box, it will not draw a line along the way as it moves there. Just in case, I will set the heading to zero, just so it's facing east. It's just good, good practice. And then I'll drop the pen ready to draw. Okay, now the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work out the width and height of the rectangle that I'm drawing. What I'm doing here is I'm taking the difference in X and Y coordinates. So I have, this is 
bottom right point, its x-coordinate, minus the x-coordinate of the top left point. Okay, now down below, you, you, we could say, hey, it should be the bottom right y-coordinate minus the top left y-coordinate, but actually that's flipped around, and the reason that's flipped around is because the bottom value will actually be lower than the top value. It's a little funky. We could get around it by using the same formula and then taking the absolute value. But long story short, because the y axis is sort of funky, this is how we're going to go. Okay, so now what I'll do is I'll start drawing the lines of the rectangle. And we could do this with a loop, but it's only four lines. So I'm just going to do it by hand. Okay, so by this point we will have drawn half of the rectangle. We can just do that again, and that'll be the full rectangle. Okay, so we could talk through this, or we could actually run it, and that's what I'm going to do. So, I've got that, that function there. What I'll do is I will say, okay, we've set up the turtle. Now we'll go draw rectangle. Let's give that a shot and see what that looks like. Cool. So we can see in real time the way the turtle has gone around. Goes by the width, turns right, then forwards, turns right, keeps going like that. Excellent. So now just as a quality of life improvement, I am going to configure the turtle so that we can't see it, first of all. Hide turtle, and then I'm going to set its speed to be instantaneous because ultimately we'll be doing 3D graphics, and if I have to watch that thing run around, it just takes a lot. So there we go. Perfect. Now let's use that function to draw a whole bunch of other bounding boxes. Okay, so I've defined the other boxes that I'm going to need. All I need to do now is, just close that down, call the method. Okay, let's see how that goes. Excellent, that is looking good. So, what we'll have is our top-down world view will be over here and our perspective view will be over here, and I guess if we want to put any info, like a nice title or something, we could put it there. So there we have it. Mission accomplished. Not bad. I see you know your turtle. Here, enjoy this celebratory sparkler. Your next mission, should you choose to accept it, is to draw a top-down view of the scene you're going to render. Okay, mission two, we need to set, or basically view the world. So in order to do that, I'm going to need a few things. I'll pop over to my constants, and underneath my bounding boxes, I'm going to define some colors. So currently, my map is going to have a few numbers. Zero corresponds to absolutely nothing. And then one and two are going to be some walls. If you're not sure what exactly these color codes are, you can get them by googling turtle colors, python turtle colors. There's a whole list. These are just some that I picked out. Next, I'm going to have my map. And my map is going to be a list of lists. So every list in here is going to be a, a row in the map. I would not recommend this for large projects, but it does get the job done. Next thing I'm going to need is I'm going to need the player's position. So this is my world. Anywhere I see a number that's a wall, I'm going to place my player basically here. So the player is going to be 
in row three, zero, one, two, three, but midway through that. So I'll say row 3.5 and then column zero, one, 1.5. So again, what I'll do is I'll make a player position and we will have a player direction later on, but I'll leave that for now. So that's all the info I basically have for my world. I'll close that down and I'll look at some functions for drawing that. Okay, so what I'll need is, mm, I'm sort of gonna break this down into several stages and this will seem a little abstract, but I'll try to do my best to recreate the way I would do this. Let me just do this right now. So let me, let me print um, I, just to verify that this is, this is doing what it should. So what I'm expecting with enumerate is enumerate will give the index of the thing in the set, in the lists, and it will also give the item. So because map is a list of lists, each item in the list will be a row of the map. We can run this. And that's in fact what we're getting down here in the console. We have um, row number zero, and then that list just like that. So now what I wanna do is I wanna go into those individual pieces. So I'll say for um, J, now I need to do something. And I'm gonna make a function called draw cell. That function will take in the row, the column, and the, the number, basically, that we're drawing. But uh, lol tricks, um, we also need to work out the bounding box for the cell. So for a given row and column, what are the top left and bottom right positions for that? Okay. Okay, lol jokes. So what I then need to do is say, okay, for a given row column, what is that? pixel coordinate there. And I promise I'm almost done. So remember this from the previous challenge. This is getting the extent is what it's called. It's basically the width of the bounding box, but then I want to divide that by the number of columns. So if I look in any row of the map, the number of things in that row will be the number of columns. And if I look at the number of things in the map, that corresponds to the number of rows in the map. So it's super important to remember that a row, although it's the first coordinate of a matrix, is actually corresponding to the Y coordinate and the column, although it's a second, is corresponding to the X coordinate. So you see this later on, we'll sometimes flip the X and Y around. That's why we're, that's why that is. Okay, so what we're doing here is we take the top left corner, we just extracted that there. As a matter of fact, we can even do this. We can extract it tuple style. Okay, now I take that left position and I add on the number of columns, that's my column index, times the width of each column. And similarly, I start at my Y, my top position, and subtract i times the number of uh, the number of rows the row that i'm in times the height of each row and then the reason i'm subtracting is remember things are a little janky and subtracting will make you go down basically and that's that's what i want so now i can simply return that coordinate okay so now i can take a row column coordinate and convert it into pixels within the world 
And now my bounding box is done. And now I can go back to draw cell. Okay, so I'm gonna reuse my draw rectangle function. So all I need to do is set the color that I'm gonna fill with, switch on fill mode, draw the rectangle, then switch off fill mode. Nice and simple. So I think this stuff is fine. All I'll need to do now is draw the player. Okay, so I'm gonna make this draw dot function. Let's put this down here. Okay, so there we go. Yeah, we basically just want to go to this row. Uh, what am I singing? IJ position on the screen. So that's why we convert that to pixel coordinates. We go there, we drop the pen, we draw a circle. And that's it. Let's give that a go, see what that looks like. There we go, we're filling in the map. That's looking great, that's all fitting. Uh-oh. Look at that. The, the player is meant to be in the center of this box because we're using 0.5. So what's actually happening is the turtle drops down here in the center with a heading of zero, so it's facing this way, and then it starts turning, 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 and going around. So what I wanna do to make sure that this is actually in the center of the box is sort of go down a little bit, go down by the radius amount and that will center us. So give that another shot. There we go, perfect. Okay, so that was a little bit of coding, so I'm gonna step back over this. What I like to do when I'm dealing with large programs is just condense them, just look at the basics. Okay, so to draw the world, we look through every tile, look at its IJ, row column, as well as what the tile actually is. We go to draw the cell. In order to draw that cell, we will need to get the bounding box. In order to get the bounding box, we'll have the top left and the bottom right converted to pixels. And here we have some math working out how to convert that to pixels. Okay, so we get the top left and the bottom right, and then we come back We've got our bounding box, and then we reuse the draw rectangle, but in fill mode, basically. So that's all done. And then we need to make the player. So I'll make a circle with a radius of 16. Basically, we drop down just below our center of our circle, and then we spin around and make a circle. And that's it. Challenge completed. I mean, mission completed. Nice one. This one is challenging but rewarding. Draw a single ray cast on the top down view. Demonstrate how the adaptive step size method is working. Okay, so before we get into this, this next mission, it's going to be a little math heavy. That's all right. So for this implementation, I'm referring to low devs classic ray casting tutorial, which everyone should really be aware of. It's a great tutorial. Um, load van der Veen, low dev. That's the one. If you look at ray casting tutorial, it'll be there. Now, what we'll do basically is imagine we're at a position and we're shooting off in some direction. What I want to do is make a decision each time about whether to step the ray um, vertically or horizontally, whether to step to a, actually, I'm not purely stepping it vertically or horizontally, I'm stepping to either a vertical or horizontal boundary. So in order to do that, there's a few parameters that I need to bear in mind. I have, let's go this distance here. 
So this is a distance along the ray, and this is, well, I'll call this uh, side distance x, sdx for short. That's how far will the ray have to step from where it is right now to get to the next x boundary, and then we'll also have side distance y, which is from where we are, how far will we need to go to get to the next y boundary. Now, in order to do that, that will be basically based on which boundary we're looking towards and where we are located within the current box. But another thing which is really important is the uh, just straight up the distance to go from boundary to boundary. So if we go from here to here, we're crossing an X boundary fully. So this distance here, I'm going to call that delta X. And this distance here, we're crossing a Y boundary. That's delta Y. What they represent is in general from to cross one boundary, how far will the ray have to step forwards? Now, in order to calculate these things, we can do it in a pretty analogous way. So just a general diagram. We have our X and Y axes uh, perpendicular to each other. Now, in one case, I want to step a distance of one because I want to cross an X boundary. How far do we step here? Well, this is the slope and this is the rays like dy over dx the raise y, uh, y component of direction over x component of direction. It's slope. It's slope. And this is my unknown, my delta x. Now, similarly, if we were to step 1 in the y boundary, we'd say, well, how far are we stepping in the x boundary? That is the raise dx dy. And the unknown here will be delta y. So I'll look at the delta x triangle and then look at the delta y triangle. So for the delta x triangle, this is a right angle triangle, so we can apply Pythagoras' theorem. We have delta x squared equals, we'll say one squared plus m squared. And then if we rearrange, take the square root, we have one squared is one, m squared is dy squared over dx squared. Then we can bring that to a common denominator. So when I see one, I've really got um, dx squared over dx squared. Add that together, dx squared plus dy squared, divide by dx squared, okay, ddd, right? Um, so when I add these two together, that is basically, remember, over quotients, square roots will split up. So we have the square root of the top, which is really the, the magnitude of the ray, the length of the ray, divide by the um, absolute value of dx. Because when you square a number, the negatives become positive, And then when you take the square root, it's conventional to just take the absolute value there. Now, what I can do is I can actually discount, like if the ray was normalized, if it had a length of one, then this would be true. And if the ray did not have a length of one, then we would still be getting the same value in the dy case. It's the same, same calculations. We get the same thing. And this delta x is being used as a decision parameter. In other words, it actually we could actually scale delta x by a constant value and the decision would be the same because both delta x and delta y were being scaled. So that is sort of what's happening here, sort of the basis for this. And this is the derivation. Hopefully the code will make sense. But again, if the code doesn't make sense, just let me know or just um, check out Load Van Der Veen, Low Devs Raycasting Tutorial. Okay, okay, so these missions are getting a little harder. This one's going to involve a bit more coding. That's fine. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to need the math library 
in order to do trig stuff. And secondly, I'm going to need to define a few more constants. First up, for this map, if the player is over here and they're looking out, say, in this direction, there's a possibility that they'll be looking into nothing, and I want to avoid that. So I will just clear off, close off the end, and add a, a backside to this, to this map. So I'll go ahead and run it and show you what that looks like. There we go. So the player is, if they're looking to the right, they're not possibly going to see any empty space. Okay, cool. So now talking about the player looking to the right, I'm also going to need a player direction. So I'll just go right down to the bottom and define that 30 degrees. Okay. Now onto the part of, um, onto the task of visualizing the ray cast. So I'll go right down and make a function. And this will basically trial one run of the Raycast algorithm. It will just draw a trace for just that one ray. Okay, so first up, we'll just get the ray's position and orient it, give it a direction. I'm taking negative sign because the Y coordinate is sort of, sort of janky. Well, okay, because the stepping up through the map is actually decreasing the row number, whereas on my screen, stepping up would be increasing the Y coordinate. So the the y -ax, uh, y coordinate sort of needs to be flipped around when we're dealing with the array. Okay, so just as I was explaining on paper, I now need to work out the delta x and y, that is the distance that the ray will have to walk to get to the next x or y boundary. Okay, these extra checks are just to make sure that I don't divide by zero. Now I'm going to need the actual position that the ray is occupying in the array, in the map, if that makes sense. Because currently ray x and ray y will be fractions, but I want integer coordinates as well. Okay, so far so good. Now I'm going to work out the distance of the ray to the next boundary. I'm actually, okay, well, what I'll do first of all is I'll declare the variables and then I'll actually define them down below. Okay, so what I'm doing here, step X and step Y are going to be the action that I take if I want to step to the next boundary. So if my ray direction is less than zero, then when I step to the next X boundary, the map X variable should be decreasing by one. This side distance is basically measuring how far would the ray have to step to get to that left boundary. So if we're looking at the left boundary, let's say our position is x equals 1.2, okay? The left boundary will be at x equals one, and so that subtraction here will give um, one fifth, 0 0.2. So we need to step one fifth times delta x, because when delta x equals one, Sorry, no, not that. When we have delta x times one, we'll be going through a full boundary. Look, I hope that makes sense. It's very difficult to convey this information online and get feedback on whether it makes sense. So please let me know if that doesn't make sense, but I'll try to explain the rest of this as we go through it. So if our ray dx is bigger than or equal to zero, then when we step to the next x boundary, we want to increase by one and then the side 
distance. The side we want to step to is not map x, but it's map x plus 1. So if we're at x equals 1.2, the boundary we want to step to is x equals 2. Okay. Now the distance there will be x equals 2 minus x equals 1.2, so 0 0.8, for instance. Okay. So now let's do that all again with the ray's y um, coordinate, uh, y direction. Okay, so I'll say this again. If we have a ray dy of less than zero, then our ray is stepping upwards in our map, upwards in our array. And so the distance will be Okay, so for instance, let's say, okay, let's say that we are, yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking this through. So if we're at a Y of 2.4, for instance, then we want to step up to 2. So the distance we need to step is 0 0.4, we have 2.4 minus 2, 40% times a full step through the Y. On the other hand, um, if we're stepping down through the array, then the place we want to step to is map y plus 1, so 3, basically, minus 2.4 will be 60% of a full step. You know, when I go through these things explicitly, it's, it's very hard for me to measure whether the thing that I'm saying is too basic or whether it's just, or whether I'm just skipping details, which I really don't want to do in cases like this. So, as always, please let me know if I'm goofing up my explanations. Okay, so now I want to just keep running, just keep tracking. And I, um, that's what the hit variable is doing. And then I also want to track whether I have hit a horizontal or vertical side. We'll say that, that a vertical side will be zero and a horizontal side will be one. And we'll just keep doing this forever. So what I want to do is I want to choose whether to step to an X boundary or step to a Y boundary. And that will be based on whether uh, basically which one of those is closer. So let's go. If we've stepped not as far in the X as we have in the Y, then we'll go ahead and step. Um, but what I'm going to do before I do any of that is I'm just going to keep track of the current position that we're at. So I'll say... Um, make some variables, get the race starting position, plus how far we've stepped so far. And because I'm stepping to an X boundary, I'm going to take the side distance X as that, um, that T parameter. Because remember, side distance X and side distance Y are both parameters which are tracking the distance, how far you've traveled, along the same ray. So you can actually take either of those and they'll all be collinear with the ray. It's almost like you've got two competing T values. And if you take one T value, you'll go ahead and hit a horizontal wall. And if you take another T value, you'll go ahead and hit a vertical wall. Maybe you go through a, yeah, anyway. So what I'll do now is I'll draw a dot and I'll draw Again, see here, I'm flipping around the X and Y because, just because, and I'm actually going to change this draw dot so that it takes radius as a parameter, just so that I'm not drawing these massive dots. So I'll just go back to the draw dot and I'll take that in there. And then back when I was drawing my world, I will explicitly put in, whoops, a radius of 16. Just because, yeah, just because just it's easier to to see what's happening on the rays if those dots are smaller. Okay, so this is basically, yep, drawing a dot along that um, that ray. What I'll do is I'll now increment and say, well, I've taken a step in the X. So this is how far that ray has marched forward. And I'll just keep track, keep track of um, which sort of side. Yep, so otherwise I'm going to step to a Y boundary, and in that case I will pay attention to the Y 
parameter distance base the ray around that otherwise it's it's the same stuff and yep change the side variable okay so now i'm going to have my exit test so i'll say um, if the current position that i'm in on the map yeah if that's non-zero then we're done because we've landed on a block okay so i'm just going to run this and see what this looks like. There we go. Have a look at that. How cool is that? So what we've done is we've stepped along and we're at an angle of 30 degrees. So we'll probably be stepping not as far to hit the X as the Y. No problem. So we'll go ahead, we'll draw a dot there. And then from here, to hit the next Y, it's a little little hard to say, right? But think about it like, okay, the question is how far would we have to go from the center here to hit not this X uh, boundary, but this X boundary, and then compare that to how far would we have to go to hit this X boundary. That's what this adding on the Delta X is doing. It's sort of saying, it's sort of sort of updating a decision parameter and it's it's discounting the fact basically that we've already hit this first boundary. I hope that makes sense. But again, we go X boundary and then we're closer to the Y and then from here we're closer to the X. And then from here it looks about equal, but we're done because we hit a wall. So finally, what I want to do is I want to draw a line from the player right to their final end point. Okay, so again, this is what I'm saying about like, you sort of have two T values to choose from. They're all collinear, they're all in the same ray. We'll just choose whichever of those was smaller. That's probably, that's probably the um, point that we stepped to. And then we'll use that to calculate our final end point. Okay, so again, we drop the pen on the start point, we draw off to the end point, and that's it. So if we run this, there we go. That's our start point. Along there, we have our end point. So there we go, mission accomplished. I see you know your stuff. Enjoy another sparkler. Bring it all together now. Use ray casting to render the scene in the right panel. Okay, so we're almost there. We've visualized a single ray cast. Now I'm going to make a function which actually ray casts. Okay, and this will be based around the existing visualize ray cast function. So I'll go ahead and grab all of that and duplicate it. Okay, so one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove anything which is plotting points. Don't need that. And I'm going to set this all up in a loop. So I'll just go right to the top of this function. And instead of dx and dy, I'm going to make some variables. Sorry, instead of ray dx and ray dy, I'll just have this dx dy. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I'm going to interpolate this dx and dy are based on just the forwards vector. So the forwards direction of the camera has two components is dx and dy. Now what I want to do is I want to run a vector interpolate from left to right. So in order to do that, I'll need to know what the right vector is. Now the trick is the right vector needs to be perpendicular to the forwards vector. So I just need a vector that its dot product with the forwards will come out to zero. And a little hack there is to use negative dy. Yep, yeah, cool. Just double checking my own math there. Um, because remember the dot product is component wise. So we'd have dx times negative dy plus 
dy times dx, that's zero. So yeah, all right, cool. So, so, so. What I'm going to do is I'm also going to measure the screen width. I'm just going to measure a few things about the, the screen that I'm drawing to, basically. There we go. Because I need to know a few things about the box that I'm going to be drawing the view into. What I'll be doing is for every X coordinate, every pixel going along that box, I'm going to cast out a ray in that direction. Okay, so I'll just grab all of this stuff and tab that over. Okay, so this is happening a whole bunch of times. So what I'll do is I'll need to know how far left or right I am. I'm going to call that my horizontal coefficient. Now if I take i and divide it by half of the screen width, that will set it up so that i varies from 0 to 2, right? Because when i is at the left, will be literally i is 0, so 0 divided by anything is 0. And then when i is at the right, i will be equal to screen width. Screen width divided by a half of screen width is 2. So I just want to center this, so I'll subtract 1 to get it from the range 0 to 2 into the range negative 1 to positive 1. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to interpolate the ray's direction. So I'll say ray dx will be basically dx plus that horizontal coefficient times negative dy because that is the x component of the right vector. And I'm actually going to just neaten that up a little bit. But this is where that formula comes from. So again, pure dx would be the forwards vector. Subtracting some dy is the action of the right vector. And the same thing is happening here. Um, whoops, for dy, that will be dy for the forwards vector plus horizontal times dx. So no errors, I think. I hope. No major errors. Everything should be set up. So we go down, we run through a full ray cast right down to the bottom here. And I'm just going to make a slight variation. If you want to know where this comes from, there is a mathematical formula for this, but that's on if you look up Lodev Raycast tutorial, he has a more in-depth derivation of this formula. But basically, turns out if we subtract delta y, that is the distance that the ray has traveled, but projected onto the the ray's view plane. So it just avoids a fish eye effect. What I'm doing here is if I take the, the center y coordinate of the view and I add 64, that'll just be going 64 pixels up from the center of that box. So again, imagine you have your box, you have your midline at your center y, then you go 64 pixels up. That will be the y coordinate for the top of the wall. What we'll do is divide that by the depth. So rays which have traveled further to hit a wall will be smaller the line that they draw. And what I'm doing is I'm also clipping that against the clipping that against the top of the box. So if we divide this and we get a number which is going off the top of the box, that will just be capped at the box. And then similarly, we'll get the bottom coordinate of the wall. So that will be clipping against the bottom and then we'll go wall uh, view center y minus 64 divide that by depth. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and draw that line. Uh, 
Okay, so I mean, this is literally just drawing a line segment. We go to the top of the wall, set our pen color, drop our pen down, and then go to the bottom of the wall. The X coordinate stays the same. That's based on the, the left of the box plus the current um, X coordinate that we're working with. We'll just go top to bottom. Okay, let's give that a go. Look at that, how cool is that? Oh, something's gone funky here. Okay, something definitely has gone wrong. So I think what I've done here is, I sort of mess this up a little bit. Let's go, yeah, we'll base it around side. So side is um, tracking the last thing that we hit. Yeah, I think that's right. Let's find out. There we go. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay. I don't know why that keeps exiting. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. What a mistake. So, I copied that code. I did not change the name. Hey, what's a, what's a coding session if there's not a bit of um, amateur comedy in there? Okay, I think this is good. There we go. So, as you can see, we have our top-down view, and we also have our perspective view. This was achieved by drawing a series of vertical lines. There we go. Mission accomplished. You are indeed a master of the turtle. Well done. Final mission now, and the challenge will be complete. Add a floor and ceiling to the sea. All right, so I think this is the last, the last mission in the turtle draw the graphics challenge. And that is basically just, just a few quality of life improvements on the, the ray casting. I'm also gonna include ceiling and floor color. So first up, I'll define the colors. Okay, with those colors defined, I'll now have a look at the raycast function, the actually raycast function. And right down here, I'm going to just define a few variables. Okay, and then I'll go right down to the bottom and I'll use the variables there as well. So here I'll use this. Okay, so we don't want to be above the top and we don't want to be below the bottom. And now I'm going to do this a bunch of times. I want to draw the, um, the floor and the ceiling. And the way that's going to work is every scan line runs top to bottom. So right at the top, there should be some region which is ceiling. We'll go right down until the wall begins. Then we'll draw the wall. And then the bottom bit will be the floor. So again, here's how we're going to split it. We'll have ceiling. So I'm just going to hard code the color. I'll say color three is the ceiling. That line is going to go from the top to the beginning of the wall. Then we'll draw the wall, no problem. And now the floor will go from the bottom of the wall to the bottom of the view. And its color, I'm going to hard code it as color four. Okay, excellent. So let's give this a shot and see the final result. Okay, so slow as that may have been, 
we have now got the result. I've got the, the ceiling up here, the floor. Yeah. Okay, so that was just a bit of fun, a bit of recreational coding. I hope you enjoyed that. Maybe that gave you some ideas. Hopefully you're feeling more confident with breaking problems down. It was just fun. Okay, so all the best as always. I hope you're doing well and I'll see you again in another one. Bye. Excellent. Well, that's it. You've accomplished the Cast the Turtle Challenge. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know. I made this to blow off steam in between work, but if people appreciate it I'd be happy to make more. As always a big thank you goes out to my channel supporters, thank you and see you again soon. Come on, get that money.